Inventor Shuttle. It's the first reusable space vehicle. Satellites may be placed in orbit and returned to Earth, or even repaired in orbit. For other types of missions, the orbiter will carry in its payload bay Space Lab. Large manned space stations can be constructed in orbit. With the shuttle orbiters, we're entering a new era in space. T-minus one minute. That's why I say go. Maybe a go. C-A-C. Go. Who's failing? Maybe two. Astronaut John Young and Bob for the minus 45 seconds. And counting. Okay, no. I think I was standing on the moon when I heard that. I was really amazed. Uh, uh, you know, it was really interesting. I didn't know anything about the shuttle. We was working on Apollo, so I didn't I had no idea what kind of vehicle it would be. Well, on April 1st, 1969, I got this phone call about 8.30 in the morning saying, go to building 36. And, and I saw the people I knew that were going into the building, so I went to go into the building and went up to the third floor, and about 20 of us were just left standing there. We'd all received the same phone call. We had no idea why we were there. And a few minutes later, Dr. Max Fugé walked in and pulled out this funny-looking balsa wood plane flew it across the room and said, we're going to build America's next spacecraft. It's going to launch like a rocket, but it's going to land like an airplane. It's going to be reusable. Shuttle back and forth to low Earth orbit, which is how we named it. When you consider the range of velocities this vehicle had to fly, it would fly subsonic, transonic through Mach 1, supersonic, and then hypersonic when you're coming in. Uh, from outer space, entry starts out at hypersonic velocities. The lifting body gave us the uh, best performance characteristics, best handling characteristics for acquiring a landing strip. One of the competing concepts was two lifting body. It was a huge, massive booster coupled with a smaller orbiter side mounted to the booster. They were both piloted vehicles. NASA quickly realized that this two lifting body configuration was prohibitive from fiscal point of view. And it was also very complicated. So that NASA embarked on a little bit different path. Take all the high value pieces of shuttle and make them reusable. And that, that's how, how, how we wound up with orbiter and main engines being reusable. And the lower value or less expensive pieces make them expendable. And that's why external tank became expendable. Another, another concept that uh, we had early on was deployable uh, jet engines. They would flop out of the fuselage somehow and then turn on. Well, that meant that you had to carry jet fuel. And then they started saying, well, you know, you'd have to land even if the engines didn't work. Well, if I've got to land if the engines don't work anyway, maybe I just shouldn't carry the engines because there's such a problem. So then the problem became one of trying to get the orbiter from California to the Cape, and then after every mission to refurbish it and to fly it back and forth. And then after several weeks, I called up Owen one day and told him not to laugh, but I wanted to show him something. We'll stay right up there where we're going. <laughs> Yes, the first uh, flight size orbiter we built was built to use in what we call the approach and landing test. And we wanted to air launch the orbiter from the back of the 747 at about 35,000 feet and fly it on the glide slope down to the runway. Well, the approach and landing tests actually proved to be very valuable to us because we found some things about the flight control system we wanted to adjust and change before we went to orbit. The valves on the RCS uh, on the shuttle weighed about half what they did on the Apollo. What we did, we borrowed a technique that Sears and Roebuck used on their washing machine valves 
to open and close the valves. The components coming together for the shuttle was uh, very interesting because it was the first time we were flying a reusable space vehicle. Reusable solid rocket boosters and a reusable 